This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you, Gail. Thank you all for watching us. And I want to thank Richard and John for joining me here today. Gentlemen, it's been an interesting week. We've got uh, some news out of New York, out of the New York Times, oh, Washington Post, my bad, that liberals and it's more people than ever, first time homebuyer guys, are kind of going off the charts. You've got Democrats. I read in the story, they literally told a story about a Democrat woman says, This is totally against my belief, but I feel we need to protect ourselves. She brought her and her daughters into my guns. It's kind of an estranged thing. These people who used to think guns were all bad now are kind of changing their tune a little bit when the, when the cost of society falling apart starts to fall on their front doorsteps. Well, I think it's a, yeah. I think it's a wonderful thing. I think it's a wonderful thing, but uh, thank you so much, whoever provided that uh, that uh, wonderful Washington Post article. When they were, when people were talking about what they were afraid of, this woman was afraid that if she walked around uh, somewhere, that she'd be shot by police. She was afraid that if she was driving somewhere and told them that she had a weapon in her car, that they would shoot her. Um, and on and on and on. So their their fears are, are, I think it's wonderful that more people have guns. I think, uh, um, you know, and all the studies have, have shown that the more guns there are, the less crime there is. Now, there, there was a spike in guns um, uh, sales this year and a spike in crime, but I think we can write the spike in crime off to the pandemic and the, uh, the, the lack of, police presence out there. So, uh, but I think the idea that, uh, you know, these people that are, that are horribly afraid of guns, um, and, and think they're evil, um, hopefully by osmosis, they'll realize that, that guns are by what a thousand to one used by a civilized populace to protect themselves and actually prevent crime. Maybe that'll actually sink through. I know Richard, you wanted to say something, so I'll, yeah, no, I, I think it's interesting that 40%, according to, uh, who knows how reliable they are, but according to the statistics that, that have been compiled in the last year, some 40% of new gun owners are people who have never owned guns before, or gun buyers are, are people who have ne never owned guns before. And uh, and it's, you know, it's probably disproportionate, at least by historical standards, more minorities, uh, more people who are uh, of uh, non-binary sexual identification, people who are uh, traditionally uh, considered to be on, on the, uh, you know, not part of the white majority uh, are, are the people who are saying, you know what, we are uh, more at risk than we think we are. And we certainly, certainly can't depend upon the police force to come to our aid. You know, as the old saying goes, if you uh, if you want to if you want police protection uh, within the next five minutes, call the police and they'll be there within an hour. And it, you know, it, it's it's a reality check. We're seeing crime in the streets as a result of the the the, uh, the Floyd riots last year, as a result of the uh, so-called insurrection on January sixth, uh, as a result of the tribalization of American politics. Whether you're uh, a Trumpista or a, or a San, uh, Bernie Sanders, Sanders in, in the East, uh, it doesn't make any difference. The the gulf between people agreeing with each other has become almost too wide to, to be bridged anymore. And so people are, are kind of retreating into armed camps. And uh, if you are looking at a society that is divided into armed camps, you want to be armed. And that's, that's kind of the, the whole situation. So it's both uh, a good thing in the sense that people are realizing that they are individually responsible for their own defense and the bad thing uh, as a reflection upon how divided and how uh, violent prone, violence prone our society has become. And I think I, I would like to add to that. I know, James, you're going to chime in. No, go ahead. But um, I think, not I think, I know that, that uh, um, the goal of, both the major political parties, uh, well, just I, I call them republic republicrats or democans, because they're, you know, they're really the same. They're they're just, 
you know, their differences are paper thin, but in order to get people to, to vote, you, you get them afraid in order to, um, uh, you know, get them to give you money, you get them afraid in order to get you to support your wacky ideas, you get them afraid. And so the political parties, the major political parties have basically succeeded in, in making the populace fearful enough um, to do something that's always been the, the right of an American and has always proved effective in um, basically doing what it's supposed to do. A gun, uh, in a thousand, 999 times out of a thousand, a gun is used by a, a, a civilized populace to protect itself. And, and the, the things that, that make the news are when guns are used by criminals and criminal acts or by uh, the infinitesimally small number of people who do mass shootings, because, you know, mass shootings are, those numbers are, are tweaked like crazy to, to make people think that, you know, your child going to school paints a target on their back when most things that are labeled as mass shootings are actually gangbangers shooting each other up. Uh, the, the things that we think of as, as mass shootings are infinitesimally small. And most uh, murders, most violent crime is committed with a handgun, not, not the so-called assault rifle. And again, over and over and over again, most times guns are used. Uh, just owning a gun, uh, having a gun in your home makes you more safe from uh, you know, a criminal act in your home. Uh, concealed carry laws cut way down on 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 or having more people have concealed carry have, has uh, a greater effect on on suppressing crime. So there's there's some good and bad, as Richard said. The the bad is that the political parties have succeeded in making people uh, enormously afraid, and when you're afraid, you you do things to protect yourself. Again, I like to like everybody to. I know, I know we we post all those the source material that we use in these discussions on the website now. Is that correct, correct. Uh, James? Yep. So it, just reading the fears that some of these people have, there was a, there was an interesting newspaper article re recently about um, there's a poll. I don't know if it's a Pew poll or a Gallup poll about what people are afraid of, and finally, 22 percent of the populace in this country is more afraid of. Uh, of uh, the government than they are anything else, and that uh, if it was you know 51 percent of the populace, I'd be a little a little bit happier. And the poll broke down along party lines, that you know it's it's uh, government was rated number one, and COVID was rated number two, and I don't know what was rated after that, and it and you know more people who registered as uh, Republicans were afraid of the government than and more. People that registered as as Democrats were more afraid of COVID. So, you know, we got fear out there, and your response to fear is to arm yourself. And I I think an armed populace is is a good populace. Um, and just and a polite a populace, reason. and I, I, yeah, polite. And I, I think the other thing that's happening is what goes around comes around. Politicians have been using fear to motivate voters to vote for them. Now, uh, what they have actually done is used fear to motivate. Uh, voters into arming themselves against the politicians ultimately mm. because yes. uh, the ultimate reason for the second amendment is as a uh, as a uh, uh, a break against government tyranny uh, the kinds of things that happened in the 20th century like uh, mao stalin hitler pol pot mm. yeah. well our our politicians like to restrict our gun rights you know under the guise of, of reducing gun violence but if you take away the guns you still have the violence i read today and that um, London has overtaken New York City in their murder rate. So, you know, getting rid of guns doesn't get rid of the desire to create mayhem. And so if you don't just deal with the desire, you're just taking the guns out of people who are able to defend themselves. Yeah. And, and so, I, yeah, go ahead, John. I think yeah, you bring up there, there's uh, many studies that have done. If you, there's a lot of mur there's a lot of, we're a murderous country. And even if you take away all the guns, we're still the most murderous country. Uh, maybe not some of the places where our drug problem has created cartel violence, but that's all with guns. So, and in in um, London, they have uh, what they wait what they see as an epidemic of knife violence. Um, you know, their people are cutting each other up, and uh, I think knives are the second greatest. Uh, 
weapon used in murders in sharp implements in in this country. But if you if you pull out all the gun violence, we're still killing each other at a, an astonishing rate. And there's some you know there's some racial statistics that I would rather a friend of mine who's a, a black uh, pastor talk about. So I don't appear to be a racist, but he informed me on them. And most of the crime is is committed by black people on black people. And um, you know, I don't know what that means, but it's it's uh, all of this is is just crazy. Um, and you know, like like Richard said, a, an armed society is a polite society. When when you think that the the guy that you you're road raging against and you run off the road in your whatever car it is might be packing a gun, you're probably going to be a little bit more polite driving. Uh, so anyway, I think I, I'm just rambling now. But, uh, yeah, we probably kicked this uh, one to death. Uh, <laughs> talking, we probably murdered this topic to death. We're going to go ahead and move on to talk about the media. There's a story here that 58% of Americans distrust the media and 58% of voters agree that the media are the enemy of the people. Now, for those of us who have been watching the media for a long time, we're going, well, thank you for finally paying attention. But <laughs> you guys have to think about that. It's, so, yeah, you know, and, and I think you need to add social media uh, to the uh, equation. It's not just the the uh, legacy uh, mainstream media that people are coming to distrust. It's also social media, namely Facebook, YouTube, uh, and uh, Twitter, and so forth. Uh, and, and for good reason, because I remember back in the, I think it was the late 90s, Hillary Clinton uh, saying that, you know, we used to have uh, control over, uh, have gatekeepers. Her word was gatekeepers on the media. That was back when ABC, CBS, and NBC controlled 90% of, of, of the news other, and, uh, as far as broadcast was concerned. And the New York Times, uh, on the Washington Post, and the, and the Los Angeles Times controlled a similarly large portion of, of print media. And there was no such thing, or there was just beginning to be a, a, such a thing as uh, internet media. And at that stage, internet media was pretty much unregulated and pretty much uh, a free-for-all. Uh, anybody uh, with an inter internet connection could set up uh, their own uh, soapbox and nobody got in the way of that soapbox being uh, picked up. Witness people like Alex Jones and, 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 and that sort of sort of person. Really nutty people could uh, get an audience and get it fairly quickly. Uh, Ellen was, was, was uh, lamenting that we, we don't have gatekeepers on the internet and that's a bad thing. Well, now we have gatekeepers on the internet as well as the mainstream media. And so people are rightfully recognizing that they're all lying to us or pushing an agenda that may or may not agree with our own agenda. Absolutely agree. Uh, and the, you know, the, the, the press is always uh, influenced, uh, you know, voters. I mean, back to the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, contrived the Spanish-American War. And, but what was uh, it that give you? I'll give me a picture. I'll give you a war, even if it's, yeah. you know, it's not a and new so, concept. You know, the, 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 you would think that with a diffused media, with so many people having a voice, that, um, that more objective media would be the result. But I, I, I think just the opposite has happened. Um, I, I used to, I, I remember, maybe, maybe I'm just getting old, Richard. Tell me if, if, uh, you remember this. Um, you used to be able to read a newspaper, and even a left-leaning newspaper or a right-leaning newspaper, you could read it and, and, and think that the facts as they were reported in the article, despite bias, uh, were correct, because that's what they taught in journalism school. And, and the bias might be there. But, but the facts as reported could be depended upon most of the time. Now when I read articles, what? True, but wait, yeah, go ahead. Now when I read an article, whether it's, it's on the interweb, as I like to call it to upset my daughter and make her roll her eyes, uh, or, or in lamestream media or on a news broadcast, the facts themselves are misreported. Uh, not just, you know, an, a, a, a lie of omission by leaving numbers out, but simply misreporting information, just making stuff up. Um, so we can't, I can't depend on, on, on even the numbers that are, are being interpreted by the news people, which isn't their job. Their job is to simply report the news. 
as being factual. Anyway, you you had something to say about Richard. Yeah, I mean, when I went to journalism school, that's when I, when I first went to college, it was in journalism. And we were taught who, why, what, when, where, and how. Uh, the five W's and an H. And, uh, uh, and for the most part, that was what media reported. But there was still the sin of omission, and that uh, was huge. If you wanted to uh, uh, present a, a particular viewpoint, whether you're a television or, or newspaper or whatever, you could simply doing it, do it by spiking the story. A story you don't like the uh, implications of, spike it. Don't run it. Don't you know, ignore it. Uh, that's still going on. But now, yeah. as you correctly pointed out, I have pointed out, there's not only a spiking of stories that uh, don't fit the uh, whatever narrative uh, you're trying to uh, promote, but you're also seeing statistics questionably interpreted and uh, in some cases, uh, facts being, to put it politely, made up. Mm. Yeah, well, that's that's the evidence of that during the, the last election. The story that was buried was uh, the Hunter Biden story oh, big time. Uh, and, and, a, and a number of other you know, stories uh, about the left wing and, and things that were basically made up um, about, you know, the Russian, Russian influence, uh, direct Russian uh, conversations between Trump and 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 it turns out later that that evidence that these stories were made up, uh, you know, the, the an FBI agent basically changing a report on on uh, uh, on on Trump's son, I think it was that 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 said that you know in essence he was in collusion with the Russians when he was actually a source for the CIA. So I mean, it just yeah, I mean, I, I mean, completely. and the biggest omission in the 2020 election was the. Ex total, without any exception whatsoever, uh, ignoring of the Joe Jorgensen campaign. Back in, in, yeah. in, in 2016, Gary Johnson got a little bit of, of, um, of CNBC, MSNBC, uh, NBC, ABC, CBS. He got a little coverage. Joe Jorgensen got absolutely zero, not whatsoever, mm -hmm. other than uh, local media. That's the only coverage he was able to get. And I can guarantee you that was uh, active spiking on the part mm -hmm. of the uh, mainstream press because they didn't want uh, Trump to have anybody uh, have anything anything whatsoever to uh, make sure that Trump did. Yeah. I agree well, with the objective, but I don't agree with the means. Yeah, well, the means cannot be a justify the ends, right? We, it's just you cannot have that because that's where you end up with unethical behavior and you end up with your ends being worse than you wanted in the first place. Um, speaking of ends, justifying the means, the means or not, critical race, there is a big discussion. The media has not been correctly covering all the aspects of it, which is part of the reason we're so divided over it. But the best choice for it is actually school choice, is it not? giving us the ability to pick and choose where we get to send our children and the type of education our children have rather than have it dictated to us from politicians up above. Isn't that the real answer to these kind of questions? If you were to ask me how to define critical race theory, I really couldn't do it because I, I keep hearing whether you're getting a definition from the left or the right, the definition uh, differs dramatically. And I don't have any objection whatsoever to critical race theory being taught in schools to which their parents are sending their children voluntarily. Uh, I do object to any kind of, uh, of uh, propaganda, whether it's critical race theory or white supremacist theory or any other kind of propaganda being taught to kids who are in essence jailed in school by mandatory uh, public schooling, which is kind of the case that we have now, with the very rare exceptions of where uh, parents are rich enough to send their kids to private school or independent enough to homeschool or use charter schools if they're available. Uh, making school choice more widely available solves the problem of parents being uh, having their kids subjected to uh, social justice theories or whatever that they don't particularly agree with. Uh, and, and that's kind of one of the, you know, the, uh, the unforeseen good consequences of the lockdowns of the last year. Uh, and it's interesting that the New York Times just did a, a long piece on how uh, homeschooling is a terrible, terrible, awful, really bad thing, citing questionable statistics about how kids are not learning uh, as well as they, as well as public school publicly schooled kids. But I think a lot of that is that they're not learning what 
the New York Times thinks they should learn. Mm -hmm. They're learning things that don't agree with the agenda of the New York Times, and that's a good thing. I, I want to share with you an anecdotal story, and I need to scrub all identifiers off of this guy because the young man needs to work um, young. Um, I recently used a ride-sharing service uh, to, to get home from an event, and a um, patriotic uh, event, a celebration of our independence, fireworks and all the rest of that. And found out that the person driving was a, a teacher, and and you know, despite the cautionary shushing of my my wife, who's in the vehicle at the time, I espoused my uh, my complete disdain for public school uh, teachers. And I remember, I wish I could remember the quote. For her last name's Peterson. I think one of the one of the the uh, the founders of basically libertarian thought. Yeah, Isabel said, Patterson. Is Isabel Patterson? Peterson Patterson. You know, she said that uh, uh, basically, um, you know, allowing uh, uh, the government to take forcibly take your kids from uh, your home and put them in the classroom and and teach them whatever the government thought your kids should learn and make you pay for the process was was basically you know the worst form of totalitarianism. But I was chatting with this fella. And he said, yeah, what's happened now with homeschooling is that, see, parents weren't aware of how much propaganda was going on in the classroom on the part of the liberal teachers, uh, the, the left-wing crazy thought, including, you know, critical race theory and, and other species thinking, which is basically right out of the Marxist handbook, you know, that, that everybody is divided by race and, you know, oppressed according to. Um, I said, but now what they can do is watch what these people are teaching their kids. And they're uh, disgusted, astounded, aghast, and unwilling to have this go on, which is why so many kids are not back in school uh, after the pandemic or being taught at a distance, why so many husbands or wives, depending on who their greatest wage earner is, is giving up their livelihood or part of it to stay home and teach their kids and make sure that they actually are the filter uh, through which uh, a moral compass is is imparted to their children. And and I was kind of thinking he was he was an outlier, and he said, "Oh no, no, there's a, there's a lot of us out there that are just disgusted by it, and we're trying to find. We know we can't teach, uh, you know, we can't teach." Uh, uh, rational thinking and actual real history and anything to do with the founding fathers and all the rest of that in the public school system. So we're trying to set up, you know, private schools online and on and on and on. And But now, I said, the parents are aware of it because they've watched it, whereas it was hidden in the classroom before. But now it's for anybody to see on the computer screen that their kids their kids watching. So... I think the, the, the panic the panic demic has had some, as Richard pointed out um, earlier, uh, some benefits because um, it's exposed this massive propaganda machine that is, I don't want to co call it public education, let's call it government education, what it is. It's the propaganda. Propaganda. Yeah. yeah. Well, as we talk about government propaganda, our vice president and past uh, senator from California was out and about this past weekend. And <laughs> she opens her mouth and says things she has no idea what she's talking about. She said the rural communities can't have access to a photocopier because there's no Kinkos out there. You know, of course, if she'd been outside, she'd know there's no Kinkos anywhere. But <laughs> That's 1901 or 2001 or 2003 yeah. or something like that, almost yeah, 20 years. Yeah, hmm. it's not even close. But it's like somehow rural people can't order a Amazon, can't order a printer off of Amazon like I don't know, everybody else in the world has done at this point. This disconnect that these uh, coastal elites, we'll call them, have for the people who live in flyover country is astounding, and it's on full display here yet again. Hmm. Yeah, and then the underlying issue was, uh, I think it had something to do with uh, voter registration laws and, and being uh, having to uh, provide a copy of, uh, of ID. Now, I don't want to get into the whole voter registration uh, morass. I'm not convinced that voting has that much of a... Of a of an impact upon the body politic anyway. So, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of a, kind of a moot point in, 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 in a sense. Uh, but uh, you have to admit that 
the elitism of people like Kamala Harris is on full display when she uh, claims that uh, uh, the, the folks in, as you put it, flyover country don't have the same uh, mental acuity or technical ability to uh, uh, do things as uh, people in, in her circle of friends. Mm. Yeah, one I, I agree. One of the the, the I don't remember that where the article came from that we passed around that you guys were kind enough to send. But they mentioned uh, one of one of Kamala's problems is that she was from the monoculture of of uh, San Francisco, uh, California, and even even more of a monoculture um, San Francisco. So she has no clue about uh, reality or what other people are thinking. I would call it reality. What If other people are thinking differently than Kamala Harris, that's reality. But let's not even bother calling it reality and just say different thought. She's not, she hasn't been exposed to, she hasn't had to deal with, she hasn't had, she hasn't been put on the spot by people who don't agree with her. Everybody around her, in her circle, the people that report to her, her boss, all agree either exactly or somewhat with her with her thinking. She hasn't been challenged, and she hasn't informed herself about what those people are thinking. And I think that's uh, uh, incompetence on the part of a politician. If you don't know what your perceived enemy is believes in or thinks or does, then how can you effectively do battle with them? And then it's it's even even worse than incompetence. It's stupid. Because if you go expose yourself as not being aware of what is going on with a populace who, who have the power to vote for you, you are, you know, committing political suicide. And we, you know, anybody who's lived in California has watched this woman uh, rise through the body politic here and all the crime she's committed when she was in, in law enforcement as a DA and, and when she was... Um, she was head of basically police here in the police apparatus here in California. Um, and, you know, who voted for her was, yeah, anyway, she's, she's scary. Uh, she's arrogant. She's ill-informed and misinformed and uninformed. And that's, well, that's a scary Yeah, it's my, so, yeah it's that, that monolithic thinking, as you, as you correctly pointed out. Uh, and it, it, it ignores one of the oldest uh, traditions of uh, political philosophy, I think, originally expressed by, or maybe even earlier, expressed by Lao Tzu, the author of The Art of War, which is that you need to know how your enemy thinks. You need to get inside of the of the head of your enemy in order to have a, a fighting chance in, in, in a battle. And the best uh, way to win a battle is not to fight it in the first place. And uh, she's continually picking battles with uh, folks that she doesn't understand. And uh, she may end up with a Democratic nomination in 2024 when uh, it becomes apparent to everybody that Joe Biden uh, is in the final stages of dementia. But uh, if she is, hey, uh, even Trump could beat her, and, I, and, and that might be even worse. Mm. Yeah, and talking about being worse, we are out of time. To, we're out of time. We have got to go. Thank you all for watching. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week. And please remember to love everybody. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint Show in Sacramento. Channel 17 on Comcast, each Thursday at 8 p.m. and each Monday at 5.30 p.m. for the Knuckleheads of Liberty. Also on YouTube, Facebook, and podcasts everywhere. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.